Hey guys, I'm Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. This is a show where I dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders and find out how this crypto movement really came to be. I'm super excited that today, to be doing my first live recording, um, to have you here with me, Jesse Powell, the fo founder and CEO of Kraken. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. This it's is an honor. This is was such an awesome idea, and when they threw out like a bunch of names, I immediately said you, and I said we have to do this. And when we did our pre-call the other day, I feel like we got a lot of the good content out there, and so I wanna I wanna jump right into it. I think the most important question that people have on their minds when they first start using Kraken is why did you name the company after a legendary Norwegian sea monster? Yeah, I get this question a lot. Um, I always say that um, you know, I had the domain, and so it was easy. I, I was, you told me that years yeah, ago when you first launched the company. I was a domain hoarder back in the day. Uh, I guess I still am. Um, I've got a ton of crypto domains. But uh, Kraken was a domain that I bought back in like 2003 or something like that. And I thought, one day I'm going to do something really cool with this domain. And um, when the idea to launch an exchange came up, I just thought, like, okay, now is the time to, to do this. Uh, the, the name has... Um, you know, it meta works. It works Yeah, really well. I mean, it's got all the hallmarks of a great, a great brand. You know, it's short, it's yeah. memorable, it's fun to say. A liquor company should make the brand. They should use it. What's that? A liquor company. A liquor company. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it'd be a great name for a liquor company. I wonder why no one's done that yet. And they've, they've, have, have they ever called you to get the domain back? Um, no, people have tried to buy the domain often. Um, I don't know if it was ever them, but we also get support tickets for them, too. People. What kind of support tickets does, like, a, a what is it, rum? Yeah. What type of right. support tickets does a rum company get um, at Zendesk? Yeah, I don't know. I, I bought your product, and, you know, like, I didn't get as drunk as I thought I was going to get, so... <laughs> So I mean, so tell me about like more about the founding of the company and and why you decided to do it. Um, we think that the exchange market is saturated now, but it was still saturated back then. Um, we had this amazing exchange called Mt. Gox that was like super good, and everyone loves it. They're still running nowadays. Um, no one got scammed by them. But um, are we doing this interview in like 2012? <laughs> yeah. Um, you have a great story that that I know you love to tell about kind of the early days of Mt. Gox. Um, it was during one of the first hacks that Mt. Gox went through. They went through multiple, and I think it was like 2011. And so the site was down, and you called up Mark Carpellis, the CEO, and you were in Japan, and you offered to help. How did the, how's the rest of the story? Yeah, actually, I, I got a call from Roger, Roger okay. Beer, who was in Japan, uh, who just happened to live a few blocks away from their office. And um, we were both already into Bitcoin, you know, heavily in early 2011. And when Gox went down, Roger, we were both trading on Gox. Roger went over there to the office to find out what was going on and discovered that there were like two guys in the entire company and one guy had just started the day before. Yeah. So it was just like Mark plus this brand new guy. And, um, you know, Roger was like, okay, we got to do something here. Um, you know, they were just getting massive support tickets. There were like 60,000 users. Uh, the whole thing was, you know, basically that was like 99% of the exchange volume at the time. Uh, so, you know, while they were offline, like merchants couldn't accept payments. Nobody knew what the price was. It was like a total disaster for the industry. So, like, Roger calls me and he's like, hey, you want to come out to Japan and, like, help fix this? Uh, so I was on the next plane and spent, you know, a week and a half out there helping them with all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And you probably learned from that, that experience saying, one day I'm going to have a company in exchange and it's not going to be like this. And kind of you've, you've done that. Um, Kraken has become the name. You know, you've never had a loss of funds. You've never been hacked. Um, everyone loves the product, loves the brand. Um, so that, that, really, that really is such a parallel from when you're, you know, I can imagine you like under Mark's chair, unplugging wires, plugging them back in, or trying to fix the code base, figure out what's, what's, wrong, with the, what's wrong with the issue. Now you're the CEO and you founded this huge company. Um, you have some unconventional thoughts on different things. For example, how a coin or a token gets named. Uh, what do you think should determine that? Yeah, this is always coming up anytime there's a, a contentious fork as to who should get the name, like with Bitcoin especially. This was a big yeah. issue less than two years ago. It almost exploded the whole industry. Yeah, it was, it was an issue with Bitcoin Cash, and it was an issue again with BSV. And actually, a bunch of exchanges got sued by some people representing BSV 
uh, for basically not assigning the Bitcoin name to BSV. How could, I mean, what determines that? How do you guys decide, and I want to ask you more about that in a second, but I mean, take us like inside, if there was an animation, we'd see like the office of Kraken and the doors would open up and the camera would swoop inside. Give us like the untold stories and take us inside of how some of these decisions happen, how things get made. I mean, you have the, the future of the industry almost on your shoulders, not to put any pressure on you, but I mean, that's kind of what happens. So your decisions don't just affect your customers and you and I, but it affects millions of people around the world. How do you guys make those decisions? Yeah, it was, this was a tough decision with, um, with Bitcoin Cash and, and Bitcoin and also for Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. And um, fortunately, we've got a bunch of philosophers on the team who like, love to debate these kinds of things. And um, oh, so people within the company themselves are ideological. Within the, within the company, I have multiple oh. like philosophy PhDs who just love to debate this kind of stuff like all day long. So um, we have like great thinking around it. You know, I, I think there's like a very strong argument for Ethereum Classic. You know, being still called Ethereum, right, as the sort of the original chain that that went on and what is now we, we refer to as Ethereum as being sort of like uh, a forked coin. You know. Um, Basically, we, we decided that we should look at something, uh, not even like you know the longest chain, um, not even like what is the original kind of vision, but more like the um, you know most kind of a, accumulated um, like a, awareness, awareness. Like, okay. like social awareness. Like what do most people associate with this particular coin? And you know, like one of the analogies we looked to was. There's actually a, a Star Trek, old Star Trek The Next Generation episode. That's what we do. You, uh, yeah, of course. Yep, the Star Trek has all the answers. <laughs> or uh, Seinfeld. Seinfeld as well, yeah. Um, and we looked at, so there was an episode with, a, with um, I don't know if you guys are Star Trek fans, but uh, where... At a crypto conference? Will Riker basically gets like forked. He gets like trapped in, there's a copy of him trapped in a transporter. And this copy eventually, it's supposed to be destroyed. So like in, in Star Trek, transporting isn't actually like transporting you. It's like creating a copy and destroying the old one, basically. Oh, okay, wow. But basically this like copy got trapped in the transporter and then it like emerged year, like 10 years later. And um, Was the original there too? The original is still there, right? So who had like basically like 10 oh. more years of, of life than uh, the guy who was trapped in the, the transporter. So, um, you know, we kind of like looked at this as like a good analogy for this kind of thing. And most people had um, the guy who had like the most time in, you know, who basically had like the most social awareness yeah. was still treated as the, um, the Will Riker, like the original. Interesting. The guy who came out of the transporter 10 years later, everyone referred to him as Thomas Riker. I think Thomas was like the middle name. And it was basically like Will Riker got to keep the name because yeah. he basically had like the most social awareness. Yeah, there was a movie like that that did something similar where one guy went on a plane and the plane was like 10 years later but so there's two of them. It was the one who stayed who was not the original. The original was the one who came back who was considered the... So, I mean, how do you... So now you have Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, BSV, Bitcoin Private, Bitcoin Candy. You have all these like different ones. I guess... So it's, what you're saying is it's not really something that you can almost quantify. It has to be more of gut feeling, but then you have different, different companies or different people that make these different decisions. Um, but that's, that's consensus then. That's where one, enough companies, enough people, enough miners, enough developers, when everyone kind of agrees and there's somewhat of a consensus on one thing, then that's how we move forward. But it could be contentious. It could be fighting. And we saw that a few years ago. Mm. And I honestly, if you were to tell me like, that the solution would have resolved itself, we'd have where we are today, I would say no way. I thought it would be a lot worse than it actually ended up being. So it's really good. Um, we talked a little bit about listing coins. Everyone here knows that you know, during that crazy ICO bubble, a lot of projects wanted to get listed on exchanges, a lot of coins, it's still a big thing. Coins listing on exchanges, if it's on Binance, it's amazing, if it's on this other exchange, it's not, that's a whole thing. You guys were very selective and careful about which projects you listed. Um, unlike some other exchanges that we're listing every single day. What goes on internally in the token listing process? I think that's one of the most, that's the question that it's like, it's the most vague in the crypto world today. Yeah, so there's a committee of people that, that are stakeholders in various parts of the business from legal, compliance, engineering, uh, product, uh, support, who all kind of come together to 
to review tokens and to decide you know, what should be the priority and, and whether to list something. And uh, there are considerations like, uh, you know, is it a security? Um, which geographies can we legally trade this in? Uh, do we think it's a scam? Do we think it has any longevity? Is it technically going to be like high maintenance? You know, are we going to have to dedicate like three full-time guys because it's like an alpha project that's constantly changing? Are these all metrics that you can write down, or is this? Okay. Yeah, it's pretty much like a, a scoring ran. system and a, and a report that's developed for each coin. And um, you know, so it's sort of basically if it if it gets cleared, um, then it'll go into the queue to be released. And you have to point. deal with regulatory. You know, the, basically these yep. jurisdictions have to approve. A coin or a token, right? Yeah. A lot of there's a lot of manpower. It seems like that goes involved in that process. So yeah. you either have to be like one or the other. Um, you guys are still launching and putting out a lot of good features. You have uh, Kraken Pro Mobile that you just uh, launched. Um, you're still adding a lot of coins and tokens. But we we're talking earlier about staking, and I kind of thought of this question um, on the fly, as, as I do most of the time. Um, you know. And I think you would agree with me. Let's go back like to the years of 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, even, even 2015, 2016. Every, we got, so many exchanges exit scam. So many exchanges got hacked. And what would we say? Never leave your money on exchanges. Like it was just a thing. It was like in our brains. In fact, it happened so much that we were almost desensitized to it. Um, oh, another exchange? How much? Only five million? No problem. Not the end of the world. That happened last week. Easy. Um, not that that's a good thing. But now you were talking about launching staking. A lot of companies are launching, you know, interest rates, crypto loans. It seems like it's, but it's custodial. So it seems like the message of never keep your money on exchanges was what it was. But now it's like exchanges are saying, keep your money with us. Is that okay? Have we reached a point where security is good enough? I'm not talking about just about you. I'm talking about you know, your whole, you know, all your colleagues and all your competitors and sister companies or whatever in this space, do you think even the ones that you like are good enough that you would be comfortable leaving money there? Are we ready for that message of, hey, leave your money here, we'll offer staking, we'll offer lending, we'll offer interest rates, and, and crazy numbers, like 10, 12% I'm seeing. Are we ready for that yet? Well, I think exchange security has come a long way. You know, we've got eight years of experience developing this. We've got a security team of 30 plus people. So, you know, I, I think we're maybe a little bit farther ahead than, you know, most others are in the space. But I would still say, you know, post your money with any exchange, you know, with, with there's risk. caution. Yeah, there's risk there. And, and it may not be, the counterparty risk there may not be worth what the return is. Um, for our clients, you know, while you have money staked, uh, you can still use it as collateral. Um, so you, you, basically, there's, there's a capital efficiency kind of thing. Like, if you're going to have money there anyway for trading, um, you don't want to be Make your money work for you. Yeah, you may want to just, you know, have it earn something for you. Of course, people can still interact with the blockchain themselves and stake their own coins. Um, it's still fairly complicated to do it. Most people aren't going to do that. But, you know, if you think you got $100 just sitting there, um, you feel like the counterparty risk is pretty but low. But that's the thing now. It, it used to be... You have $100, send it back to your ledger or tracer. Now it's, you have $100, keep it here, and you can earn a percentage on that. And that, that's OK. Like, I'm a big fan of having your money work for you. I, I want to do it. But I just get nervous of how vigilant we used to be versus how vigilant we are now. But I still think that self-regulation -regula is, is the best way forward. Y you're a big proponent of that. Um, I know that I remember, and we never talked about this, I remember like years ago, you were really pushing hard, and you had staff for, for putting together a self-regulatory organization. It was an SRO. And I remember, and this was like, I never even heard of that. I was like, what is this concept of a self-regulatory authority? Uh, so you were really forward on that, I remember. But I guess maybe it didn't hit off at the time because people were, were just like, let us be left alone. But you were right. We should have. How did things move forward with that? Are you, are you pleased with the self-regulation that we have in the space today? Well, what we learned in the process of trying to do that is that it's, it's not going to be successful unless you really have government backing if, if, this, if okay. the organization has some teeth to it. Because people can just opt out and benefit from not complying, basically. Yeah, it's There's like the, the UN there. human rights you know, thing. Venezuela can be in there if they want. Like, anyone can be in there. Right. 
Yeah, so um, you know, it's worked out very differently in Japan. It actually is a very tight connection with the government, and the government relies on the SRO heavily to advise and to, to make policy and to enforce. Uh, so um, it can work well, I think, in the right circumstances, but here we just didn't have the, the buy-in from the government. It's, it's really interesting how different government, and I know this, this, is, this is talked about so much, but how different jurisdictional shopping is and how that's gotten such a big thing now. Um, you have companies like, you read this company's moving from this jurisdiction to this jurisdiction. I'm like, but what does that mean they're moving? It's still, they're all still based in the same office in San Francisco somewhere or wherever they are. Um, so I mean, do you see like a common denominator in certain, in certain countries versus other countries, like other things that you can kind of tell? I know that in a lot of Asian countries in Japan you talk about, they're a lot more forward and willing to work with you. China, not so much, but even, I mean, this whole bull run that we've been having, everyone is saying thank you, China. But then you have a lot of Western countries that are just very negative um, towards crypto and not willing to open up their ears. And on this show, on Untold Stories, we've talked about, we've talked to politicians. I've had um, a vice minister, uh, a minister who's a vice president, of, vice president of his party in India, and he said, he's like, I love Bitcoin, I love crypto, but the problem is there are just some people, one or two guys that run the central bank, and they're just like, no, I hate it. Well, you see stuff, I mean, in the United States, just these, these Libra hearings and just show that um, the guys in power really don't understand technology. They don't understand crypto. Uh, I don't think that's a, you know, it's not a revelation. You know, I think people want to clap, but they're afraid because they know there's, there's a Fed sitting in the <laughs> right, audience right now. The NSA is recording this. Uh, that happened in uh, Vegas. I was doing a panel with Pomp last week, with, a few days ago, and he's like, yeah, we don't need the U.S., everyone should go. And people were like trying to clap, but they were like, oh, looking around. <laughs> yeah, Facebook's recording the conversation. No, it's uh, true, though. Yes, you know, so it's been, it's been very tough in the United States. I think that the machine is just so big, the bureaucracy is so big, um, and uh, the incentives are not really aligned. Uh, but, um, yeah, in other, in other smaller countries, even in, within the United States, in, in certain states like Wyoming, um, Wyoming has really taken the approach of um, Bitcoin and blockchain being like a, a business opportunity and an, an economic development opportunity for the state. And they've passed 13 bills, which are wow. super, super pro crypto, super pro Bitcoin, pro developer, makes things very clear, provides excellent consumer protection, and way better consumer protection than you get from uh, an entity in New York. Or There's still the that federal overhang, though. That's the thing. This is still the problem in the U.S., right? There's not really any way to opt out of this U.S. protection um, at the federal level other than moving yourself you know, into, to another country. I think this is something that will work itself out. The market is efficient when we allow it to be, and so I think this will resolve itself. How, you know, where the U.S. fits in down the road, I hope. There's a bigger presence, but however things you know, fall. Um, when we come down here, there was a sign that said, happy birthday, Bitcoin 11 years. You, you saw it. Um, it's been 11 years since Satoshi wrote the, you know, came out with the white paper, October 31st, uh, Halloween. I, um, I can't believe it's been, I thought it was only 10, but it's been, it's been this long time. Um, if you look at like a scale of, of the years and you look at, you know, fervent ideology, and I'm not talking about like fundamentalism, I mean just more like love and ideology for the space. Um, it's definitely gone down. Although, like, having been here today, having been um, at the conference in Vegas a few days ago and having run the show, I'm learning that people still do, are there for the love, and they, they are there for the ideology. They just may not be the most vocal. Um, but I was talking to someone about this. We were debating, and he said how he thinks, and he, he, and he was at the first, um, I think it's Computer World, that conference. Like, and actually, that, the first Computer World conference that took place in 1994, 1984, took place in the same room as the first Bitcoin conference in San Jose in 2013. Um, so that, that was pretty crazy, I found that out. But he was saying how like ideology in, you know, the computer and internet world was like, huge in the early days and then when internet and computers became a thing, that tapered off and there's not like people you meet that are like, oh my God, I love the internet. It's just a thing, we love the internet. Um, do you think that crypto needs that ideology anymore? Do you think like it's good to be like a little bit fringe or do you think, do you kind of wake up during the day and say, oh, like I miss those, those days when it was a little bit more about the love and 
and you know, ending the Fed and stuff like that? I think we still need that because we're not out of the woods yet. You know, there's still a lot of governments around the world who, who haven't made up their mind about crypto or who, who are kind of waking up to crypto. And you see like stuff with Libra is kind of being, I think like a wake up call uh, to some people in government that you know, this could kind of um, get really big. And um, so I think we still need to, to hold to these ideals, right? We don't want to just create another PayPal 2.0 where everything is fully controlled. There's by some, some people that are OK with that, like creating another Venmo or a PayPal 2.0. But that's not what we're here for. That's definitely not what I'm here for. I don't think it's what you're here for. You know, I think most people at Kraken are still believers in, in the mission, which is to bring crypto to the world, fully decentralized, you know, no, no permission to, to participate in the financial network. What type of questions do you ask on a job interview when you want to bring someone onto the team? I'm just curious. Like, yeah. I don't even have this question prepared. We actually have an ideological purity test. Okay. Wow, this is, I want to hear, this is an untold story. Let's hear this. Uh, yeah, so I mean, we, we ask people uh, all sorts of questions, you know, like, what do you think about Bitcoin? What do you think about the government? What do you think about the Fed? Uh, <laughs> You know, how would you, um, if you were going to attack Bitcoin, how would you do it? Imagine oh. you're a government, how would you do it? Um, what type of answers do you get? Um, you know, it's, we get different answers. I mean, it's, it's a really good question to test someone's understanding of Bitcoin and kind of like, you know, what the levers are. So it doesn't like, really matter like what their answer is. It's more of like if they could answer and intelligently. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, some people might say, well, I would, if I was the government, I would just, I would ban every business from taking it or... You know, I would, I would, um, you know, put up a firewall around the country like China and block all the, the IPs, you know, for nodes and stuff. I've heard a lot of ways that you could attack Bitcoin and shut down Bitcoin, and they, I always would be able to hear what the person was saying, and then in my head come up with a way, a reason that wouldn't work. And then the other night, someone said to me a way that he would attack Bitcoin, and I'm like. Oh shit, that's actually really good. Well, don't say it. I don't remember what it was though. I don't remember. I was trying to remember. Good. I was in Vegas. That's the right answer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, there's definitely that, and I love, I love how that's still there. You do get a few people who are a little bit burned out, and that's okay. Um, I think the industry is moving forward. So we're like, uh, let's just pretend it's 10 years because 11 for the math. Um, where do you see us in 10 years from now? Are we still doing conferences? You think, are we, is it more of like, we're a thing now, what are we conferencing about? It'll be more conferences that may be focused on healthcare tracks or supply chain management or exchanges or industry, but it won't be like, crypto's amazing, let's just have a big meetup and everyone will talk about it type of thing. Do you think we'll be still doing these? Uh, I, I think this will be like a core group of people who are still there. I don't think Bitcoin or crypto will have taken over the world in 10 years. That's a good thing, though. That means we have time to buy more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, get in early. Yes. Still. Cracking. Uh, but I think, you know, eventually it's just going to become <laughs> like, a, you know, TCP IP or something, right? There's not like a conference for like, you know. I guess there should be so a conference for TC IP. There should, you could bring it back. <laughs> yeah. Do it next year. I don't know anything about it. I know that that's, you know, it operates the, the infrastructure of the internet, but, um, and it's the protocol. And it's a, it's a very good analogy because it's, um, you know, the protocol that uh, where Bitcoin's going to be, I think, is that we're going to have this protocol that, that fundamentally um, changes um, how we do different things. So I guess the best answer that I've heard is we'll just be using it, but no one will really know or care that we're using it. And so that's where we'll be in 10 years. And I don't know if I like that answer because I like going to these events. They're fun. Yeah, I love these events. I, I still think it's not going to be totally buried by then. And, um, you know, I think some countries, they're only going to be able to use raw Bitcoin. You know, they're not going to have, like, these second layer services because they may just be made explicitly illegal. And All services. It. Yeah. As these services get bigger and more registered and better regulated and in more jurisdictions, I think that option of being able to shut all those down in one country won't be a thing for two reasons. There'll be much more, but also everyone will be, um, will be using Bitcoin. And for this purpose of this conversation, I'm using Bitcoin and crypto you know, uh, together because there are a lot of coins that could be heavily used later, privacy coins, whatever they are. Um, but this was another, another good, the last tidbit that someone told me the other day was that 
in his view, and he's very new to the scene, he's like, in my view, what I love about Bitcoin is that I know that if I, if I own some today, in 30 years from now, it'll be the same. The fact that Bitcoin won't change is one of its best assets. And I'm saying to myself, I actually kind of agree with that. But at the same time, if we don't innovate and grow, will we lose out? And so that's definitely something that needs to be watched out over the next few years. Yeah, I agree. And I don't think Bitcoin necessarily needs to be all things to all people. I think it can, it can choose a use case and just be the best at that particular use case. I think the more it can do, the better. You know, it'd be great if it were both a, the best store of value and the best payment system. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's obviously a lot of competition to do these things, and it, it could be that the landscape changes completely 10 so, years from now. So pretend you're interviewing me right now, like ask me a Bitcoin ideological question. I want to see how I would answer. Give me the hardest one you guys got. Oh, man. Um, it's been a while since I've been administering these tests. But You should just jump uh, into job interviews for people and see what happens. Yeah, I'm stealthy. Um, OK, uh, so. Um, Hold on, I got to get my pen. <laughs> All right. Um, you can either hold dollars or hold Bitcoin. Which do you Only? Want? Yeah. Forever? Forever, yeah. All right, let's, let's take a vote. Let's take a vote. If you want, if you would hold dollars for the rest of your life only and no Bitcoin, raise your hand. Okay, if you can only hold Bitcoin for the rest of your life, raise your hand. For those listening into the, to, to the show right now, I think it's overwhelmingly Bitcoin here. Jesse, thank you so much for doing this with thank me. You. It's been awesome. It was enough time. Thank you, guys. Do it again. Thanks, everyone.